vengeance in reverse uh, is a reference to the idea of inverting the sequence. Uh, in vengeance, uh, each side reacts to what happened in the past, what happened before. Someone hit you, you respond, you hit them back. The stupid thing in that, in a way, if I, is that uh, each side knows that when they hit back, the other side will reciprocate. So vengeance in reverse is foreseeing the fact that the other side will reciprocate. A vengeance is already a kind of a vicious circle, a kind of loop, if you will, because uh, if someone hits you, you want to hit them back. Uh, someone kills a member of your tribe, uh, the, the tribe is going to want to kill someone in the other group. And each side reacts to what happened in the past uh, to try to even things out, to settle the score. The problem is that everyone is always reacting to what happened in the past, even though they know. They know that if they kill some of the other group, the other group will come and want to kill someone in their group. They can, they can foresee that, but as long as they're in the cycle of vengeance, they're not actually doing anything about it. Why not offer them up something in advance? There is a, a twist on, on, on vengeance. Uh, because if you say, we will offer you up a victim in advance, you're actually changing the direction. You're, you're turning time around in a sense. You're saying, we will, do, we will give you in advance what you would take from us otherwise. How do people make the shift from fighting to making peace and having peaceful exchange? Because once one side gives a gift, then you have reciprocity again, but you have a reciprocity where you're exchanging, you're exchanging something good rather than killing each other. René Girard has talked about the importance of sacrifice in escaping the vicious circle of violence. And I found that if you look at actual rituals, if you look at actual rituals where people make peace, uh, what they do is they usually sacrifice an animal. And they sacrifice the animal as a substitute for the, the person who would have been the next human victim. What happens is that the last victim of violence, in this case, is an animal. The violence is diverted away from humans to the animal, and the animal then becomes the first gift. In the positive cycle of reciprocity with gift exchange, each side, in a sense, is giving the other side the gift in advance, they give gifts because they know the other side will give gifts in return and peaceful relations will continue. So that is a, a twist, an inversion, a vengeance where each side is simply reacting to what happened in the past. It's a little bit like uh, when you want something from someone and you say, you know, could you please do this for me? Thank you in advance. If vengeance is defined as reciprocal violence, then the opposite of vengeance would be non-reciprocal violence. Sacrifices which are repeated ritually have a beginning in a non-ritual act of violence, in a spontaneous event. And the spontaneous event is essentially a lynching. And a lynching is something that exists in real life. It's something that it happens again and again in, in different cultures in the United States, in the uh, South. We know that there were lynchings uh, through the beginning of the 20th century on a regular basis. Uh, you, you can find lynchings in, in situations of crisis all over the world. Girard says what would happen in a very early culture if there was a, a crisis, there was violence that ran out of control, and it ended with everybody attacking a victim, and if that led to a peaceful resolution. What Girard suggests is that first, in the future, if people wanted to avoid a new crisis or resolve a, 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 a new crisis, they would want to repeat what worked before. And the second thing he says, which is very uh, counterintuitive, is that the victim, the scapegoat, uh, <clears throat> in retrospect will be perceived as something more than a scapegoat. We tend to think of a scapegoat as someone who is blamed for things that go wrong. And that is true. But what Gerard says is that if everyone 
lynching the scapegoat leads to peace and unity because everyone is involved uh, at the expense, of course, of the scapegoat. In retrospect, people will credit the scapegoat with bringing peace to the society. And so the scapegoat will become, in the cultural memory, a hero, and maybe even a god. The first gods would be victims. In this book, I look at uh, myths from ancient India, where uh, we can see uh, a god of this kind in the making. And there are actually, I look at two different cycles of myths. Uh, one myth is about the origin of a god who is a positive god, Indra, the, the king of the gods. And in this myth, the way Indra is, Indra is created is that all of the other gods get together and they, they're trying to find a, uh, a leader and they, they're not sure who should be the leader. Each one contributes the most precious part of him or herself and all of these elements from all of the gods unanimously which they deposit in one place. Uh, it's almost as if everyone uh, put a contribution in, in, in the bank or something. That then becomes Indra, and there are different versions of the myth. In one version, Indra is the sun. It becomes the sun. Indra is a, is a sun god. And in this myth, there is no violence. But there is something unanimous taking place. Everybody contributes. Then there is a different myth I found, which is about uh, a scapegoat, what we would call a scapegoat. It's about the father of the gods, Prajapati, who is accused of incest with his daughter. And since Prajapati created everyone, uh, there were no, his daughter was the, first, uh, was the first female. But the other gods say, Prajapati seduced his daughter and is evil and we need to punish him. But who is going to do it? Who is going to do it? No one wants to step forward and say, I will take on the father of us all, I will take on the most powerful God, the creator God. So again, the gods aren't sure what to do. And then, miraculously, in this myth, we find the same method. Each God takes a part of himself. Except this time, the part of himself is the evil part. It's the most violent part, the darkest part. And they put the darkest parts of themselves together. And out of the combination of the darkest parts of all the gods, a new god, what I call a metagod, is born, and this is an evil god, and a, and a, and a killer god, and this killer god then kills uh, the, uh, the, the, the god who has been accused of, of incest. And I think it's, it's really interesting to see the way, in this case, we have again unanimity, but it's unanimous violence. And it, to, uh, to have a sort of overall explanation of the origin of the gods, you just have to put together the two different myths I talked about. In one case, you have the good side, the god who, in, in, the god who is the savior. And in the other case, you have the bad side, the god who is the victim. And in fact, the victim, it makes sense that the victim came first because it is easier to choose a victim than to choose a king. But in retrospect, that victim will be remembered also as the creator, the founder of the society. Um, and so a human culture then is founded on this process, this mechanism of unanimity minus one.